guys, welcome back to another episode of The Best Practice Show. My name is Kirk Barron. I got a special edition from you, or for you, and I didn't even know what was going to happen today, but my good friend, Dr. Kevin Groth, set this up with some other good friends, so we're having like coffee talk, and uh, you're going to love this because we're just going to roll because that's how we roll, and we're going to be talking about a big problem that you guys normally have in your practices, and I'm just going to throw it right into the room and figure out what are these guys doing and hopefully this will help you because this is what this podcast is about. It's about making you better. And if you're better, your practice is a little bit better, and then your life is better. So keep showing up, keep hanging out with us, and uh, that's what you can expect. So hey, I want you guys to introduce each one of yourselves uh, and tell our listeners who, you're lis- who they're listening to. Who are you guys? Who wants to go first? I guess I'll roll with it because I set this up. So I got somehow thrown into like a group chat with Rob and Bob and Pat. And like I said, I've never actually seen what Pat looked like until just now. So, but we've been talking back and forth for what the last like four or five months. And um, I'm just happy to be here. And I'm always happy to be on a group chat with people because I learn all the time. So I said, Hey, let's just set up a podcast and, and do an interview with Kirk. So to introduce myself, I guess I'm Kevin Groth, um, restorative dentist out of Detroit, Michigan, and just happy to be here again, over and over again, because I keep not messing up. So I get an invite back. So um, just I'm ready to roll with this dialogue because I, again, like I said, learned so much from these, these group chats and I want to just kind of share it to the public. So I don't know who wants to go next, but okay. Well, I'm going to cut you off for a second because I'm experiencing a little FOMO. Like I, I'm not on this chat. You know, you guys always <laughs> talk like, like Marges is like, yeah, I talk to her like five times a day. I'm like, dude, you talk to me once every other week, if that. Sure. And he's like, yeah, I just talked to Lilith this morning too. I'm like, what kind of chat? <laughs> like, do I need crunchy hair? Like, what do I need to be on with you guys? Like, how do I get a pass to get into this? You know, so. All right, let's roll. Who? I don't know. I couldn't tell you how. I just got associated in this group chat, and there's a lot of the dialogue. I have no stance on anything. I'm just sitting there being an observer. And obviously, like Pat and I, we talk on the side, I guess. I don't know. We're just like, we'll just let Robin Bob rip it. But it's it's fun to be a part of it. So it's good. It's there really you fun. go. All right. So, I don't know the secret, though. I wish I could tell you, but it might be the hair. But Bob doesn't have hair either. So I don't know. I don't know. Could be. Facial hair? Yeah. All right, who wants to go next? Rob, you go. I'm Rob Ritter. I practice down in Jupiter, Florida. Uh, Yes, I'm a friend of Bob. I'm a friend of Pat, friend of Kevin. We started this a couple of months ago. It's been a lively interaction in the morning. We came up with the name The Young and the Sleepless, and uh, it's always an interesting drive in. Um, We have some diverse ideas on how to practice, and... um, you know, I just think there's a lot of opportunity out there for people. I'm, I'm one of these people that thinks that sharing information makes us all better. And the idea is to make us a better, better practitioner, make us a better profession. And uh, I've gleaned a lot of information off of podcasts and webinars, not just in person, but, you know, sometimes just when we saw each other, Kevin, talking outside of the meeting room two weeks ago at the Restorative Academy, I learned as much on the outside talking to friends as I did inside during the lectures. And I just want to share information. It's a lot of fun. Sometimes it's great to bicker and disagree because that's where growth comes from. You know, if you're if you're just doing the same thing every day, you're not growing. And if you don't hear new and different ideas, then you're never really going to change. And if somebody's uber successful and has that $15 million pro, you know, practice doing 10 times EBITDA and all the other things that we can get into, that's great. But that's not what 80% of the dentists out there are doing. And so I just want to share information and, and learn from everybody else as we go. Yeah. Now I'm already confused five minutes in young, young and what sleepless. Come on. You guys help everybody with breathing. Like you're supposed to make patients feel better. How can you call yourself sleepless? <laughs> well, you because Bob doesn't it, sleep that well at night. That's oh, he doesn't. Okay. No, he or doesn't. young <laughs> or young. You guys are young. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Who's this Dr. Lillis guy with the good hair? Oh, uh, well, thanks for making me feel good, Kirk. So, um, I'm Pat Lillis. I practice in Kansas City, and um, I've known. I'm originally from Des Moines, Iowa, so I've known Bob Mar just I think my entire life. But um, when I went to college, I kind of disappeared for a while, and then went to dental school and residency, and then came back and uh, was doing a lecture down in Napa Valley for our good friend um, Steve Sherry and John Wallace. And mm. uh, in the crowd was Marjois, mm. and so um, we reconnected at that time and just 
gosh, been talking and texting and been good friends ever since. And then I met Rob years ago for at Biomet 3i. We were lecturing together down there. And um, and so immediately, obviously, hit it off with Rob right away. And so I have known him over the years and and consider him a good friend and always just glean off what he has to say and just try to listen because I think he's a wealth of knowledge, um, not only from the clinical aspect, from the practice management standpoint too. Um, and he's just willing to share and he's willing to take younger guys and 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 kind of become mentors and friends and stuff like that. So, um, so it's been a really special relationship with those two guys. And then with Kevin, uh, the last several months, it's been really awesome. And I don't know, I think it was either Ritter or, or Bob that brought Kevin into this group. And, and it's just been really great to listen to his perspective because I would say maybe I'm kind of the middle guy of this group and Kevin's probably the younger guy. And, and so to get that generation, I guess I'm a generation removed. And so to really kind of get that information from him and to listen to him. And I told him the other day that he is, he's got to be light years ahead of his peers because he's just a sponge and he's, uh, he's willing to, you know, show cases and say, Hey, I'm, what do you think? I, what do you think about this? And that takes an enormous amounts of vulnerability. And in this group, um, it takes a lot of vulnerability and we're just willing to help and kind of share ideas because we don't know everything either. And so, um, so it's been just kind of this really unique, awesome group to be part of. And I just feel very fortunate to, to be part of it. So yeah, yeah, that's me. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now let's call this out too, right away. So you guys set this up with Marjois, and of course, Marjois, we love you because I'm going to make you listen to this. Like you didn't even show up to your own group this morning, no. so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna roast you, buddy. So he's like, "Yeah, let's put this on. It'll be great." And he's probably on a plane somewhere or something. So yes. So right. let's yes. so let's start off by saying this about Marjus, right? Let's do it. So yeah, he was supposed to be on this. I had no idea he wasn't going to be on. He was eerily quiet, which should have let us know then that he wasn't going to be on right there. That mm -hmm. was the tip of, tipping off. So, yeah, I mean, he's sort of the glue that keeps us all together. I met Marges 20 something years ago. We've been great friends, traveled together. When I say friends, I mean, I mean, it's funny. I ran into Pat. You know, I'm going to Vail next week. I remember seeing you at the Sebastian Hotel. God, how many years ago was that? Six, seven, eight years ago. And yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, and you know, we, me and Mar just travel together. We've we've roomed together. We we go on vacations together with our families. So I mean, he's an integral part of my life. And he's, you know, I, I've said this about Bob. I know you're you're. I think you hold Bob in the highest regard there, Kirk. And he's a tremendous clinician. Um, he uh, is also a wealth of knowledge. He's incredibly well connected. You know, Coyce has said about Bob, if you're not friends with Bob Marges, you can't be my friend. I think all of that is, is true. And I'm going to say one other thing that's going to make Bob very, very happy when he hears this. Yes, Bob, you have a very profitable practice. The way that you choose to practice dentistry is very profitable. You do a wonderful job. You do high quality dentistry. I've said this as well, boys, you know this, that his patients are probably the most spoiled patients in the entire country because they're getting some of the highest quality dentistry at bargain basement fees. There you go. There you have it. It's That's just the way it is. It's true it's, though. Absolutely it true. true. It, yeah. it, I, I didn't say anything that was derogatory. It's absolutely true. His patients get some of the highest quality dentistry at fees that none of us would do. Yeah. It's awesome. And we're going to go kind of down that path. Uh, so you guys can expect this. I'm going to, I actually like the spontaneous nature of this. And so we chatted before we hit the go button, just like talking about a big challenge. And so Rob, you said you got a good one here. And I probably have this conversation once a week or twice a week with a dentist and bring it, bring us, bring us up to speed on what, what, well, what you uh, thought let me, would be a let me good throw this challenge. out there. Let me throw this out there to everybody and then we'll just springboard off of this. Obviously, it's a very challenging time, a challenging time in professional life and personal life, right? Oh, by the way, there's a shortage right now of windshield wiper fluid. I just want everybody to know that. I went to get windshield wiper fluid, and there's a run on windshield wiper fluid. You can't get that anywhere, just like you can't get cream cheese anywhere. But that's Is the there a surplus of anything, though? I mean, <laughs> I just think there's a shortage of... I yeah. think there's a surplus of Zoom meetings, yeah, but other than Zoom meetings... <laughs> um, so... Uh, we get this problem right now. We hear it all over the country. It's supply and demand for hygienists to work in your practice. I know there's not enough hygienists. Either they left the profession, didn't come back, or they're coming back and asking for 
uh, some of the most unbelievable uh, salaries that I've ever heard in my career. And then dentists are struggling on how to compensate them. And so I'll just tell everybody that, um, you know, it, it's an interesting thing with hygienists. Let's just, let's just start it there. I think we'd all agree with that. It's very interesting because remember they're taught in hygiene schools that they don't work for the dentist. They work with the dentist. They are that mid-level provider and they want to be compensated because they typically have more education than our clinical assistants or our administrative team. Yet, I don't make emotional based decisions on how we compensate our hygienists. I don't, I won't, I will not go down that path because we are running mini cottage industries, but they are based in numbers. And I, I told Kirk something a couple of weeks ago when we did our podcast, nobody knows. Bob is very adept with numbers, but Kirk, you didn't, you didn't know at the time that he was actually getting a uh, accounting degree. Yeah, I didn't. I had no idea. Which then all of a sudden, it's remember, it's not what you tell, it's not what they tell you, it's what they don't tell you. No wonder he's so good with numbers. He's had a financial background for almost his entire life. Right. Okay. So when it comes to hygienists, here's what I do is pretty simple. I know what I charge for a hygiene profi for an hour. I take that number times eight, because that's how many patients they're going to see in an hour on a typical day, mm -hmm. not including the new patients, not including the scaling rib planings. I times that by eight. And then I take 30% of that. And that's what they can make for the day as a starting salary. Okay. Okay. All right. Because yeah, my thing is most general practices run somewhere between 60 and 70% of overhead. Correct. That's what it costs them for overhead. So I'm not going to compensate them more than that because my overhead is somewhere between 60 and 70% in most general practices. Now people on this panel, I mean, Pat Lillis probably runs at 50%, but you have to make that determination based on what your overhead is. And you need to know that number, obviously, right? Uh, as a starting point. Now, on top of that, I've got two ways for them to make bonus money, legitimate bonus money that will increase their hourly rate on things that they do. So we do a bare ass minimum, a BAM, and I know how much they need to generate for the day, right? So in a general practice, let's just say it's $1,000. They need to do $1,000 for the day as a BAM. So what I do is I give them 10% of anything over $1,000. So if they did $1,500 for the day and they get everything, whether they sell a toothbrush or a whitening kit or a, or a fluoride treatment, whatever they sell, I don't, I don't care um, if they sell it. And I know we're not supposed to use the word sell by the practice management consultants, but that's what they're doing. They're marketing or selling, whatever you want to call it. So if the difference is $500, they get 10% of that is $50 and you amortize that out over eight hours. And how much is that? It's an extra four or $5 an hour on top of their initial amount of money that they're going to get. The second compensation is when I go in the room and I diagnose a unit, a crown, an onlay, a veneer, an implant, they get 1% of whatever is done. So if I do a crown and we just say it's $1,000, right? They get an extra, you know, $10. If I do two crowns, I diagnose, they get an extra $20. You amortize that out. It's an extra $2 an hour to their salary. So all of a sudden they're making a very good per hour wage. Yeah. There very cool. Very cool. So let me, let me ask a couple more questions because I want to really kind of get down to the root of this, you know, so you're Rob, you're in Florida, you're in an awesome place in Florida, Pat, you're in Kansas city and Kevin, you are in Michigan. Let's talk about the landscape first, you know, the landscape, are you seeing the same thing? You feeling the same stresses, having the same conversations. Let's talk about the big why before we get into the how, what, what, what's been your opinion? I mean, across the board, I think nationally, there's that high demand for employees, not in dentistry, but just everywhere, right? So you're looking at Taco Bell's advertising $17 an hour. So it's hard for like a small business owner to keep up with the, the, the need for employees, but just also the drive to have to, to make it all work financially. So I love Rob's philosophy behind this because there's no emotion. It's simply just a matter of knowing your numbers, calculating it out and saying, this is what what you do now i guess my question to you rob would be i i got kind of confused over the whole percentage sure. thing like i, I guess that would be really difficult to track wouldn't it be if if you're somebody that's treatment planning or, or how do you how do you manage that so that it's okay easily so to calculate I'll, I'll make it simple so my 
Office Manager, we have an Excel spreadsheet. And at the end of the day, she totals up from when the, when the hygienist brings the patient up and says, Dr. Ritter, I'm just gonna give you an example, is diagnosed a crown on number 19 for Mrs. Jones. And when Mrs. Jones, can, so she writes that down and writes down, you know, out of one of my, hyg we'll call her hygienist one, Dr. Ritter, Mrs. Jones, tooth number 19. And they keep track of that for the day and she punches it into an Excel spreadsheet. When Mrs. Jones comes back to prepare the tooth, they get paid on the day of the production of the unit. It's not based on diagnosis, on, they get paid on the actual production, but we sure. keep track of it on an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. All right, let me Got ask it. you, Pat, too, just the conditions in your, you know, in the Kansas City area, and how do you see this challenge in and around where you're at? Yeah, probably the same as everywhere else. <clears throat> I mean, I've been a little bit spoiled over the years because my hygienist was with me my entire career. Um, so it's a very symbiotic relationship and she knows what I'm thinking and I know what she's thinking most of the time. So, but, uh, we are at the point now where we probably need to bring in another person, maybe a couple days a week, maybe, maybe not. But you know, so it's what Rob is saying. I think what Rob is saying is like one of the very second or third times I've heard a dentist put metrics to it. Cause up until then it was kind of like this pie in the sky unicorn theory, right? I mean, we never really knew what to do. And so what Rob is saying is really hardcore metrics and it takes all the emotionality out of it, right? I mean, this is probably the most emotional conversation you have with your hygienist because they're very, they're high, they're high hourly employees. Let's be honest. I mean, what you pay a hygienist is a lot yeah. and they're worth it. But what Rob is saying is really truly metrics. And I applaud him for saying that because up until then, it was kind of like every dentist was stressing out when you're having these staff and salary reviews with your hygiene. It's like, and then it became, well, what are you doing? Oh, I don't know. What are you doing? Oh, I don't know. What are you doing? And it's, that's, that's not a great way to do it. So I like, you know, I'm, I'm learning a whole bunch here. So I like what Rob is saying. And, yeah. and I think it's great to put metrics onto it. I'm going to give you one more, Kirk. You ready Tell for me. this? I have four hygienists, four days a week. Okay. So I have big, big hygiene, right? Their salary is exactly the same. So I explain love that. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very, pretty simple. I have one hygienist that's been with me for eight years. I have two hygienists that have been with me for two, two and a half. And one that's been with me for like three and a half. I don't care how long you've been with me just because you've been with me. That's great. That means that you're doing a great job. I appreciate you and value you what you're doing in the practice and for my, for my patients, but I'm not giving you a salary based upon longevity. I, that that's great but that doesn't mean much to me. It's based upon performance. And so the other thing we all need to recognize is that hygienists talk amongst themselves. And so what I don't want to set up is one hygienist making $40 an hour, another hygienist making $45 an hour, and another one $50 an hour, because then there's animosity between them. And then you've got this constant stream of them coming in. One comes in, well, this one's making 45, this one's making 50. It just becomes a logistical and emotional nightmare for the dentist having to deal with a structure that really wasn't to me thought out well to begin with. They're all the same to me. They, right. they all have the same value to me. They all have the same value to the patient. So if that's the case, I'm going to treat them exactly the same because my feeling is if they're not performing the way that if one of them is not performing the way the other three are, my feeling is what Kevin has done. You're not going to work for me anymore. Yeah. And so okay. we yeah. just make it simple. Okay. So a couple of things, I just want to throw this into the room too, because if, you know, you guys are three fabulous dentists, you have three awesome practices. We got a lot of young dentists listening. And what I don't want them to hear is, well, you just go down and tell them the deal on the money and like, it's all going to work itself out. I think we would all agree, like, let's list out the things that make it work in your practice. And this has been my experience. I've been doing this for 25 years. Anyone I've ever met where money's the number one reason they work here it's usually a pretty short path. Money's important, don't get me wrong, but it's usually never number one when you're dealing with great team members. Yeah, they need, you know, can you talk about the prioritization and what you're trying to do as a dentist and connecting and really making this work? Because Rob, what you're talking about is absolutely true. We need clear lines of sight on how we create a healthy relationship, but let's give everybody a perspective on really how this works. No, I totally am into that. So I, I have a hygienist who's, she's my longest employee, which is, I think she's worked for me for six years. Mm -hmm. Um, it says a lot about Rob's influence on me, which we can talk about in a minute, 
But to me, it's it's one of those things that um, she and I worked together at two offices, both mine and another office. And when I took over my uncle's practice, she came right up to me and said, hey, I want to work with you full time. That's awesome. And to me, that was like the best compliment because it wasn't about money. It wasn't about benefits. It was, I value you as my employer and you take care of me. So it doesn't matter what you're being paid. Ultimately, that will get to a certain level, but it's what you do, the intangible benefits that, that I talk to her every day. I care about her. I do the things that really go above and beyond what was being done at the other practice. And it came down to it. And like, he tried to steal her, buy her over. And it was like, to me, she goes, I, I won't ever leave you, you know, because that's just something that I, I know that I, I know what I get out of you. I feel comfortable. I feel secure. I, I, I don't know. But to me also to tie in Rob's point, hiring a new hygienist right now, because I'm in Pat's situation too, is I, I knew need another hygienist. I also don't like the fact that any type of new hire right now is going to probably ask more than what I'm paying my current team. And then now you're, you're in this conundrum, like, well, now do I raise up everybody to that level? And now my overhead's going uncontrollably high, or do I feel guilty the fact that this new hire is coming in and I'm paying them more than the people that have been with me for X number of years where I'm loyal to them and they've been loyal to me. So I think maybe using that as a, as a leverage point saying, Hey, let's just restructure this. So it's fair for everybody. And then the third thing is I listened to a podcast yesterday and they do at their office a, a percentage based. And he said, it's amazing how much treatment is actually planned or how many perio scalings are done from this because you're actually doing the dentistry that you've been kind of avoiding because it's more incentive based. And maybe it's, it may be seeming deceitful, but maybe it's also just, you're doing the right thing instead of just kind of dodging it because you feel like you're not treating the patient correctly, which is kind of incorrect in its own right. So yeah, I don't know. This is why I love this stuff. I do too. I do too. I I love it. I love it. I learned so much from these guys because it's like, you guys make me think. I know Pat, I can see your wheels going. What are you thinking? Come on. Based on what Kevin said. So uh, one thing to build on this just first um, is that we didn't talk about how there are certain times in offices where hygienists feel like I'm more important than the rest of the team, right? So there'll be a piece of uh, gauze on the floor and the hygienist will be like, well, I'm not picking it up because I'm the hygienist or the phone will be ringing and all of your administrative staff are on the phone and they won't answer the phone, even though they're just sitting there. So I tell them, I said, listen, here's the scoop. We're all on the same plane, right? That's including me because you can't do your job without me and I can't do my job without you. And the hygienists are no more important than the administrative staff. The administrative staff is no more important than the dental assistant. I'm no more important than any of the rest of them. Everybody's on the same plane. So if the phone is ringing and everybody's answering the phone, I'm big on answering the phone. Like I do not want the phone to go unanswered. So they, you know, Shanda, our hygienist knows that she gets on the phone and she picks up the phone. It's just expectations. So I think that with dentists, if they don't set the expectation with all of the rest of the team, then this is what happens. We get, like Rob was saying, you get a hierarchy. And when you get hierarchy, bad things happen, right? Yeah. Because now you got one disgruntled employee, another disgruntled employee, this, that, whatever. And next thing you know, you've got a total debacle on your hands and the team is not going to, the team's going to completely fall apart. So I think that's important because I've seen this in other offices that uh, I work with uh, referring to dentists of mine and you'll walk in there and you'll see hierarchies. And then you walk into a really great practice where everybody's on the same place. Everybody's, everybody's equally as important. Right. And I tell my staff all the time, I said, my name's on the door, right? So I'm ultimately responsible for this entire armada, but at any time and ever that you want to buy the practice from me and have me work for you, I'm totally fine with it. Right. I'll just negotiate my salary and then I'll just work for you guys. And so far I have not had one, I have not had one offer, but we keep it all on the same plane. Everybody's on the same plane. We're not one more important than another. Yeah. That's awesome. Now I have so many questions. Okay. So when you're talking to a high, just bring it. So let's, let's speak to the person who's like, okay, you guys, I can't find a hygienist. Okay. So help me. What would you say to the person listening in that respect? Because I hear that one too. Are you talking about quality candidates? I've, I, I think well, we if you're looking for a quality candidate, or I've had the ad running for a long time, or you don't understand my environment, or I, 
you know, I find a good one and they go somewhere else because they want more money, you know, type of a thing. So then if it's about the money, then that person wasn't a quality candidate for mm-hmm. one, two. I mean, I hired an assistant a couple of months ago and she looked at me like, <laughs> She's like, this can't be real. Like legitimately, I don't understand how you have a salary that's devoted towards a monthly employee wellness benefit. You know, like my one employee, she takes the $39 a month and puts it towards a Peloton, you know, and, or whatever it is. Awesome. Like, and then she posts a picture of her Peloton saying, thank you, Growth Dental. And so it's like, did you just buy her a Peloton? I'm like, no, but it's a monthly bu- like benefit that I give them because like, I care about you. I want your wellness. The happier and the healthier you are, the better you're going to be at my office too. So it's an investment Man. into everybody. And to me, it's just that energy. And ultimately, it builds on each other. And I mean, the best compliment I had is a new patient came in and just said, do you guys like take like happy pills or something? Because I, I would love some of those. <laughs> and it's just an energy is contagious. But I didn't have that five years ago. And that's attributed to this specific podcast that I listened to over and over and over again. And Rob was on that thing talking about your weakest link is what your expectations are. And if someone is dragging you down, it's time to free up their future. You let them go. And I'm a huge advocate for that. I'm not saying fire everybody that you hate, but at the same point in time, you should over time. And and to me, it, it, and it's addition by subtraction for the most part, because I saw the energy build once I let the first one go. And then it became this, we raised the bar higher and higher. So I don't know how that answered your question, but to me, it's just about how you take care of people and assembling a group of people that you surround yourself that you love and appreciate. And it's not a fake thing. And it's amazing when you have it. It's a big deal. Totally. All right. So let's go back to the metrics. A couple things. I got a question for you. I'll just throw this in there. Okay. So I love your formula. It's great. What about capacity issues, challenges with the schedule, cancellations? Does it mess up your Excel spreadsheet? And how does that relate to everyone having the same salary? Do you have some type of a reconcile, you know, point where you're just going to say, hey, look at, look, look at what we've talked about, what expectations are, and we've got a small discrepancy. Like, how would you guys handle that given the formula you've laid out? Pat? Uh... Cancellations and note shows, that's really a team effort because your hygienist is back and doing hygiene, right? And so if she has a cancellation, let's say at three o'clock and it's nine o'clock in the morning and she's got a straight run of patients, how is she going to get somebody in? So again, Kirk, it's back to expectations that you have with the team. And so the team knows that they've got to fill that spot. And I do it pretty simple in the fact that I tell them, I say, we, we add up uh, chair time at the end of the month for me and for the hygienist. And again, when we go to metrics and we have our me- monthly meetings, we look at those metrics and we say, okay, how much open chair time did we have for hygiene? And if you start doing that, you'll start looking at it and you may want to see that and you may not want to, because you'll look at that and you may have like 10 hours of open chair time for your hygienist. That's one day a week. So that's what we tell our team. It's like, listen, she sat there for one day a week and that's borderline ridiculous. And so we have the same thing with our open chair time too. Circling back to your candidates, like people, I hear that too. If you're like, oh, I need a hygienist. I need a dental assistant. That's the other thing too. You can't buy quality dental assistants right now. But I got to tell you, it kind of comes down to what the vibe is in your culture in your office. If you're not going to attract good candidates, if you have a bad vibe in the office, So is it taking longer to find people? Yeah, it is. But they're out there. I just hired a dental assistant, I don't know, like three months ago. And we we had one bad candidate after another. But here's the thing. We didn't get bogged down with them. We just kept moving on. Like, we didn't even interview them. If their resume was crappy, we didn't even bring them in, right? So we got very efficient with it. So people say, yeah, they're they're not out there. They're out there. You just got to be patient. And don't waste your time. And then also when they come in for the interview, what are they coming into? And so I, they're out there. You just have to have the right um, core values in place and you have to have the good vibe in the office. You know, when you step in an office, Kirk, and you can measure the tension with a knife. Well, now imagine you being a candidate coming in these offices. Oh, yeah. Would you want to work there or not? And so they're out there. You just have to kind of weed through them. And it may take a while now, but they're there. They are there. I unequivocally do. Not, I'm not buying this. They're there. 
Yeah, you guys know this. You walk into any office, the eyes tell the story. <laughs> it doesn't matter what people say. It's the eyes. You're like, whoa, you guys so, don't even so, like yep. each other. So let me keep adding to what they said. So when we hire people in the practice, what we do is my office manager will go through the applications. She will do some sort of a background check. She'll narrow the list down. We bring them in for just a very small conversation with myself, Ramsey, and, and my office manager. Then they come back for a working interview. And we and then from that, you know, we'll have one, two, I don't know how many employees come back, uh, potential employees. And then I say to my team members, who should we hire? You're hiring them. And the team says, we like candidate B. Mm -hmm. I said, great. So then they come back on a 90 day trial period. If they work out after 90 days, great. If they don't, the team comes to me and says, um, uh, not good. <laughs> I think we need to move on. Hence, I do not hire or fire employees. My team does, because the truth is they're the ones working with them every single day. Right. And so that's how we do it in our practice. Number two, I have a high, I have a concierge at the front of my office. When you walk into my office, there's somebody sitting at the front desk. She doesn't do financials up front. She just checks patients in and does the hygiene coordination. And she is a master of hygiene coordination. You have to imagine with four hygienists four times a day, especially through the last two ridiculous years of our lives, with every excuse possible under the sun, she has been working harder than anybody else ever in that position. Yet, as Pat said, as Kevin said, it's a team effort. And when she can't do it, somebody else will jump in there and help her out. And somehow, some way, she fills that schedule every single day, not just with recalls, but with people trying to become new patients. And scheduling out, Kirk, let me tell you, it's a challenge right now, finding spaces for new patients. Sometimes we'll tell them, we don't have a new patient appointment for you until May. Now, when you first heard that, I know you as a consultant will say, that's not going to work. You got to get them in within the first two weeks. However, the schedule is so fluid that what typically happens is there are cancellations, what I call bomb outs, something will open up and we get them in, in the two week cycle. We do. Very cool. This is great. I love this stuff. I mean, to me, it's just some, I, I don't know. I'm all into it. I guess I want to follow up your question, Kirk, about like the implementation of this type of percentage. Cause that's what my wheels are spinning right now. Yeah. I would want to calculate it out based on a, I don't know, three or four month average and then bring it over to my hygienist saying, Hey, this is something I'm considering. Yeah. This is where it would be based on where we are, you know, right. and it's, it's out of the intentions that are good too, because I think I, I, I know my dad always complained about when he made changes from a monetary amount, they always like critic criticized him and didn't believe that he was doing things with the right intention, that it was like money driven, Yeah. even though like, because they didn't like him. <laughs> you know, and he didn't like them. So anytime he made a change, <laughs> it was always just like with Dean's trying to screw us. Yeah. And that's not to like poke at my dad, but like I learned that from him quite mm -hmm. quickly. It was just if they believe in you and they trust you, and then you come to them saying, I'm I'm looking to make a change. I'm not doing it right away, but I would like to show you what it would benefit you with. And you have still stability. Cause I think a lot of people that work as an employee want to know that they're not really unstable or their pay is get up and down, up and down. They kind of like a consistent pay. So if you show that based on the averages, this is what it comes to, I think they'd be quite comfortable with it. Yeah. And Kevin, let's go down that path. So let me ask you guys. Okay. So one of the things we didn't talk about 4,000 codes, perio, like how does your perio philosophy fit into all this and what happens in hygiene? Because you guys know this, you look at left enough of these metrics, you set up a plan like this, your 4,000 codes go up. Guess what happens? Restorative. There's always a relationship. People, every dentist I work with is like, man, our 4,000 codes went up. And you know what happened in restorative? It's crazy. So how does that relate in your practice? And how do you have these conversations around this formula and its implementation in your offices? I have another thought with that, too. Is I think once you offer this type of scenario, then it'd be like, what kind of training can I offer you? There you go. To get you to even have more to offer to patients. Because if I can train you better, then we all benefit from this. So Kevin, can I interrupt you for something? How much investment can I go? Absolutely. And then I want Pat to chime in on this. 
we just had this conversation with the hygienist about two weeks ago. Now, I wish Ramsey was on this for this one section. Can't have him on for everything because he'll take over. But in this okay. one section, he says, is it my job to constantly train you? Or is it you as a professional, not only should we train you, but what have you done on your own volition over the last two years to become better than you were yesterday? Or is it our job as the employer to constantly provide all the CE and they don't have to do anything outside of the practice? I'm throwing that out there. Pat? Yeah, so that dovetails into this. So we do growth conferences independent of salary views. <clears throat> we do them once a year. And in that growth conference, my team is supposed to come to me with three of their goals that they want to do. And not only that, how they want to achieve them. It's not my job to tell them, I want you to do this, 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 and this. Nuh-uh. They've got to come and say, hey, I want to do... Uh, I want to do more resting, or I want to learn how to uh, intraoral scan into, into hygiene or whatever it is. I don't care, but they got to come with three goals and they know they got to come with three goals. And then how can they do to achieve? Now I'll help them. Right, Rob. I mean, if they want to do this, I'll help you, but I agree with Chris. It's not my job to tell you that I want you to do this, this, and this. No, that's gotta be your job. And when you do that, now they're taking ownership, right? They're taking ownership. So yeah, I agree. 100% yeah, I, with I think, Now, let me go granular on this. So, Pat, do you have them fill out a form? It's a set appointment. They schedule the appointment. They run the meeting. Because that's a huge shift that we've had. We do check-ins, but I just show up. Like, I don't, like, write out things, put things together. They bring it and set it up, and that's been probably a big part of your system, right? Kirk, my, my line in my office, outside of Margis's lines that I use every day, what? Are that I'm just an employee here. I just work here. I take out the trash at night and I sweep up the floor. These girls run this place. And guess what? They do. Mm -hmm. Right. So absolutely. hundred percent. We have, we write that down. So it's a whole form. They fill it out and then we have an action plan. And guess what we do halfway through the year? How's it going? Are we doing these? Are we doing these goals? You know, how are yeah. we doing it? Because they could, it's one thing to say it, but to do it are two different things. So yeah, we write it down. We have a whole form. I'll give it to you. It works good. Independent yeah. of the salary review. Well, right, because I don't want to mix the two. Now, think about this. you got documentation in HR. You're keeping a folder on somebody all the time. You know what they said. You're not going, I can't remember what she said last time. You know, like, we're checking in on your plan. This is your handwriting and what you said you wanted to accomplish here. How cool is that? I, I, I love just it. threw out my HR. I love it. I mean, wait, I, wait, wait, back. <laughs> Kevin, what? You just threw out what? <laughs> I had all that crap. Um and you threw when it I first out? got out of dental school, I was like meticulously documenting every move that these employees did. Uh -huh. And then a year a year goes by and we sat in this really cringeworthy meeting. I said, you were late on May 20th and you didn't do this, this, this. And it was just a, I don't know. I, I was a horrible leader. I thought it was great. I thought I was president of everything. I thought I was a great leader, whatever it was. But um, yeah, I just found that because we moved. So I found all these files and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I wrote them as substandard, even though they were. But to me, it's it's one of those things that I love the quarterly check-ins. That was probably one of the best things we've done for our practice because it allows me to sit down face-to-face. -face. And I distinctly remember a lot of these dialogues. So I don't have to sit there and like, but they come to me with a sheet and they say, this is what's my high, low. This is my professional high. This is my goals. How can I help you? You know, how can you help me? And they run the meeting. And to be quite frank, I've been so busy and so chaotic that I haven't had to do these quarterly reviews or quarterly meetings probably for the last six months, five months. And I feel so disconnected with my team because of it that I just said, I'm going to make it happen the next couple of weeks that we'll do these again. Yeah. I um, just, you're going to love this. I just heard this quote. Whenever you tell yourself you don't have time to do these meetings with a team member, that's the perfect reason why you should take the time to, to do that. with these meetings. I love meetings. that. You know, I love it. You know, can we put a, a bow tie on this? Everything you said, I have a quarterly uh, uh, meeting with my hygienist. Some of these things we're talking about, I do some of them I don't that I'm going to implement, which is the value of what this podcast is all about and sharing information for best, what I call best practices. Um, Kirk, I think, you know, when it comes to hygiene, it's an interesting thing. Um, I don't know how it works in other people's practices we're sharing. They're a different department, uh, even though they're part of the team, they do have a different type of mindset I found than the other team members. 
And so through the years, it's, it's what I call a work in progress. I don't think it's, you know, a destination. I think it's a journey with them. And um, we're constantly modifying it. I want everybody to succeed. I really do. I don't like the interpersonal drama at all. Um, I, I look at it as like what Pat said, you know, and, and one of Marge's lines that he does have is, I'm just a referee. I call as I see it. He stole my other line, as everybody knows. He stole my famous line and takes credit for it. But um, but that's the way I see it, too. I, I actually don't want to really manage the practice. I want them self-managing themselves and go to my office manager, who's been with me for 22 years of institutional memory. I want them to do conflict resolution on their own. I don't want that. I'm trying to empower them to be to be the best they can be for our for our patient for our patients, and then our patients become the ambassadors for the practice. We have longevity. We have brand recognition. There's a quality aspect to all what we do, and I want that to ooze from the employees, whether they be assistants or hygienists or team, you know, uh, front office administrators. To when people come in the practice, they know right when they walk in, I'm in a different environment than I've ever been in in any other dental practice. Why would I want to go anywhere else? Absolutely. Leaders inspire leaders, right? I mean, that's all it comes down to is that that's exactly what you just said. And see, I have a superpower. Yeah, I have a superpower. Um, my wife is a hygienist or was. So like I have a perspective that's so different. And so anytime I take something in there, I bring it to her and she goes, no. <laughs> a horrible idea. I would never do that. I would never, ever do that, Kevin. And so I became a vastly different leader because I listened to her as someone who has been a hygienist at an office and in a well-run office, also the, the worst of the worst offices. So whenever I go to her, she's always shooting things down or building it up or changing my mindset towards something because I don't think along those lines. So that's a huge thing is, is to have her I in love my corner. That. I had one of my coaches say, don't ever question your wife's judgment. She married you. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> Kirk, uh, Kirk, okay, that's awesome. I love that. Um, I know there's something else I wanted to get to. I don't know how much time we have left. Go ahead. How much time do we have left? You can, You know what? There's no rules here. Guess, guess who makes the rules? <laughs> we do. And yeah, the but, you know, I, podcast, I, also know that, I also know that you want to keep it in a format where people will, you know, what, what, they don't think it's it's too verbose and it's just never ending. I want to make sure that we fit in the for sure, chain. for sure. So yeah, if we can go. Can I add one more, one more, one more thought about the hygiene before Let's we do transition. it. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the value of my wife. So I was saying how I, I truly believe in a balance of life. I believe in, in taking time away and it rejuvenates you. Also like I, I can't work five days a week. I just can't, but I have three <laughs> amazing hygienists that work five days a week. And she goes, Kevin, they're young. They haven't started their families yet, but you have to be careful of this because you're going to kill them. And um, she goes, what if you have said, hey, right. and we're struggling with like a front desk. We need more people up front, but I also want to hire the right person. So she goes, how about you just start figuring out a way to have them work four days a week and then one day up front right. and, and transition that because now you have more energy for these people to work the four days a week. You bring in a fourth hygienist, but there you don't have the capacity to do four full hygienists for five days. So it helps facilitate this wheel that then you can maneuver that. And I did that with one of my hygienists. She just got so burnt out and she's just like, I'm done. And I said, I love you. I want to keep you. And I moved her up front for three days a week and she's happier than she's ever been. And she sells so much more dentistry for me because she knows it. She trusts it. She believes in us. I love that. Um, I just got a text saying, yeah, I just sold the case and he put his deposit in. So, I mean, it's just, it's a continuous thing. You're constantly changing, but that's props to my wife. That has nothing to do with me. And that's her thinking and that's her protecting the hygienist aspect of this practice. Totally. So. Totally. I'm glad you brought that up too, because dentists have been privy to a secret that a lot of the world hasn't is you can figure out how to really be productive in four days a week. And if you guys have friends that are entrepreneurs, you know, this research is true. I have a friend in San Diego who just changed his entire company to work four days a week, 10 hour days. And guess what he said? Guess what happened to their productivity? Skyrocketed like skyrocket. So they're still doing the same work 40 hours a week, but now all of his employees leave on, they're not working on Friday. I'm like, Oh, dentists have been doing that for a year. He's like, you didn't tell me. And she, he's like, it's crazy how Actually, now that's a long day if you're doing clinical dentistry, but that's is. a whole nother conversation. But, but, but I like but, what but, you're but saying. Funny, but what you're saying though, it's funny. Let's go down the list. Pat, how many clinical days were you treating patients? How many days a week? Now or previously? Now. Now I'm, I'm working three days a week now. Kevin? I'm back up to three and a half. 
Okay. I was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'm at three. So Kirk, we're going even one step further. We're all working three days a week chair side. And then I think all of us do an admin day, right? Like today is my admin day. Yeah. Uh, and I have to tell you, it has fundamentally changed my life. I went to this three, three and a half years ago, and I see everybody shaking their heads. Yeah. And I heard that from you years ago. Just kept thinking to myself, how am I going to do this? You know how you do it? You just do it. You just go to your treatment coordinator and say, I'm out starting, uh, no, I'll just say something, May 1st, I'm not working Thursdays here anymore. And they're yeah. like, what? And you just say, I'm not coming in on Thursdays anymore. You know what happens? They find the treatment. They book it properly on the Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. You get everything done. And in fact, your productivity, as you said, goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. Your stress level goes down. And your ability to enjoy dentistry, both in and outside of the office, takes off as well. Yeah. And there's a ratio. There's, I don't know, we got to do a podcast. There's a hidden ratio in there and there's a lot to it. But you guys know how this works. You've heard this for years. Don't work in the business, work on the business. But the people that actually do it and work on the business, that's where the return comes. So I don't want people to hear, oh, I'm just going to cut back to three days a week and head to the beach, and man, it's going to go way up. No, there's a lot more to that than that. And Kevin, you've had a chance to talk to the highest producer we have this year. He's probably 50-50 split. He spends half of his time working on the business and half of his time doing yeah. clinical dentistry. So I think he does two days a week, you know, or whatever. So he's doing two, two in a week time. But he would tell you, like, working on the business is a favorite part. Like, I, you know, I don't mind. So that's it. That, you know, what he does is a little bit extreme. Like, I don't know that I would ever want to have what he has. He's just an incredible thinker. But the same principle applies for you. Pat, you're not just heading to the beach after three days. You're doing some thinking. You know, you're probably doing some reading, taking a course, giving a course. Rob, you same thing too. Kevin, it's dangerous being friends with you because you're making me read all these books now. I just started dive die with zero. I freaking love it. I'm on chapter two. I can't stop. I can't stop. Yeah. Do you, know you, got, you know what? You know, okay. So let's start the die with zero chain. You know who started the Good. die with zero? <laughs> who? Wait. No, me. Oh, oh you did. Hey, wait, wait. I'm, oh. I'm noticing a trend here. Rob, Rob, I'm oh, feeling like we got to, we got to, I hate to be this guy. You know what? I cannot Rob. let this go on any longer. Rob, we're going to give Marcus you a big hug. Like, okay, so listen. Much from me Marcus has been doing all it. these lectures telling everybody in the United States, read this book that I found. And so like, if he's listening to this. He got that from me because the guy doesn't have to work <laughs> another day of his life. So I told him, I read Die With Zero and I have a different perspective. So then what does he yeah. do? He starts telling everybody, oh, I read this great book. But Marcus is so famous for taking credit for things he didn't hey. do. And people Listen, love Marges. We love Marges. From my perspective, I don't give a crap who said what. I'm just grateful you guys sent it my way. I'm the last on this text chain. As a matter of fact, I'm not even in the text chain. So, like, I'm reading books after you guys have all read them, right. talked about them, you're implementing them. I'm just getting started on this journey, but I freaking right. love that book. I love it. Yeah, I mean, I have a signed version from Marges in my house. So. Oh, <laughs> right. and That kind of backs okay. it up. Whoa. Right, so. Whoa. I, was, I was supposed Whoa. to sign that book. I was supposed to sign it as for your wife, and I didn't. So, okay, you know what? I'll back off of that. I'll still maintain, though, that he stole uh -oh. my most famous line. You though. know, we started you know, this, and you were pretty happy. You don't look very happy right now, Rob. No, it's, it's not that I'm not happy. I, I'll be happy once I say this. He stole I do know you most, recommended it. Uh, no, it's okay. I stole. He stole my most famous line. Which one? Everybody, you know what it is, right? Just Mr. because referee. you don't want to do the oh, wrong, bad, yeah. right, wrong thing, I'm not going to do the <laughs> what? Wait, do it. Wrong say thing. it the right way. You don't want to do the right thing doesn't mean I'm going to do the wrong thing. He and does give you credit for that. He does give you credit for that. No, I know that. Only, he only started because I started stone cold busting him in study club meetings when I would use the line and I'd see this incredulous <laughs> look on people's face. They go, don't tell me Mar just said that line. They said, yes, he did. I said, did he give me credit for it? And they're like, no. No. So then I called him out on it about two years ago. He's now he says, I give you credit about half the time. I'm like, Whoa. oh, that's, that's my big <laughs> Thank you very much. Whoa. Thank you very oh, much. That's a heck of a book, though. That is well, a heck of a book. Okay, and that's a so, whole different level of dialogue. Oh, I'm yeah, going, I don't know. I'm just gonna go oh, there then. Gosh. Like, what else? What other cards are you guys not? What other cards do you have that you're holding tight to your chest that you're not willing to share just yet? Because you guys said you were sharers. Like, give me your good stuff. <laughs> I think the biggest thing from that I took away is that life is about experiences. Yeah. And yes. and you can't have certain experiences in your 20s that you can have in your 60s yeah. and 40s. And he does this triangle of, of needs. So you have time, you have health, and you have money. When you're in your 20s, 
you have your health and you have time, but you don't have money. When you're in your middle phase of life, you have money, you have health, but you don't have time. And then when at the end, you have time and money, but you don't have health. So you need to navigate that triangle to figure out how you can maximize your experiences based on what you have and also overcome the experiences based on what you don't have. So when you're in your 20s, go to Europe, spend the money, find a way to get the money and do it because it's going to be a life investment for your experiences. In my life right now, I don't have any time. So I need to figure out how I can free up my time based on what I can do. So I'm going to have somebody plow my snow. I'm going to have somebody cut my grass. We're about to have a baby. And I told you, Kirk, about this. Like laundry is the biggest hiccup when you have a baby. So I'm going to pay somebody to do my laundry for the next two years because it's going to make my wife happy. It's going to make me a lot happier. Mm -hmm. So all those things. But then when you're 60, you have you have money and you have time, but you don't have your health. And that was a key thing for me was realizing that because the healthier you are in your middle, the better and longer life of experiences you can have later on. Yeah. So I don't want to have my knees replaced at 60. I don't. I'm going to lose 30 pounds because I need to. And I was going to text you this morning because chapter two, I forgot what he said. He called it the experience dividend. He goes, a lot of you guys looking at your portfolios, like looking at your, he's like, no, I'm making investments. And I I hope I get that right. But it was a dividend off of an experience. I freaking love that. There's a little statistic I want to throw in there about health. That's really, really, I think, and I heard a speaker about two years speak about this. I'll try to make it brief. He said, if you can make it to 60 years old, without a major cardiac event or cancer, which are the two biggest denominators for health. I'm not talking about the really weird things that can happen to you. And I'm not talking about accidents, a car accident, talking about maintaining one's health, no cancer, no cardiac issues. If you make it to 60 without a major event, your longevity, you should see the graph, how you turn into an octogenarian, it goes through the roof. So the key is when you're 30, 40, 50, you absolutely take care of your health and don't wait for something to happen to you. You get out in front of it like I do. I'm, I'm a nut. I'm a, I'm a nut about not having one of those things happen to me and monitoring my health uh, on a basically almost like an, a monthly numbers where I'm, I do a lot of metrics, obviously, because if I'm a couple of years away from 60, the chances of me living longer are going to take off. And so that health quotient that you're talking about plays a huge factor in it because I think it's the other, I think it's the other way when I think about it, when you're older, I think if you take care of your health and you have the money, the one thing you don't have is time, time, meaning at the end of your life, Warren Buffett says, I give away all my billions. If I could add another 20 years to my life, guys worth $7 billion. He says, I give, I give away seven, you know, $6.5 billion to get back 20 years of my life. He's relatively healthy and he's got money, but he can't get the time back. So health is a huge, huge, component of what you're talking about. Absolutely. Well, let's bring this home. I want to, I want the good word of the day from each of you based on what we've talked. We covered a lot of things today, talking about a formula, talking about culture, talk about check-ins, talk about a great book that I'm just starting. Um, what's your good word of the day for anybody listening? I think I'll go back to what Pat said at the beginning about just, I don't even know how I'm in this dialogue with these people, but I learned so much from it. And there's nothing more intimidating than like Rob on Thanksgiving week texting a picture of a case and saying, Kevin, what do you think? I mean, here I am trying to (laughs) show what I know, but at the same point, I know that these three people are educators and they just want to share and they want to educate and and inspire because they could see that I am motivated from this. And that almost empowers them to continue to keep grooming and, and going forward. So be vulnerable let your guard down and lean on people because ultimately it makes the entire culture and and community around you better. And that would be my good word is I'm just grateful for this community that we've kind of built up and established because it motivates me and I think it motivates them. So that's what I would go with. Love it. Rob, Pat, who wants to go next? I'll go. I'll let Rob go last. Um, I would say relationships, you know, dentistry, what makes dentistry special is relationships. You know, yeah, I mean, we do all these, do these amazing cases. I think we all, we all lecture and and, and our educators over the years, all that kind of stuff. That's all great. But I think Rob, you said it a couple weeks ago on your podcast that you guys said is that, you know, that's why they set up the protocol because 
he just wants to, they want to give back now. And I think that's truly, it's like we accomplished what we want in dentistry. Now it's our turn to kind of give back and bring the young people in and start getting them going. And that's relationships. And that's what's made dentistry for me so special over the years has been the friendships, the relationships, um, all of that. I mean, that's really what, what makes us special. And I think the more dentists can do that and reach out and, and really develop those deep seated relationships and friendships, the more enjoyable your career is going to be. I, I'm a firm believer in that. I really mm -hmm. truly am. My grandfather was a dentist in Des Moines and a lot of his friends were dentists and they would go out and have dinner and they do things. And, you know, I mean, those, those were just deep seated relationships. And, you know, he practiced till he was 80 because he loved it. And I think he loved it because of all of his friends and the camaraderie he had with a bunch of, of his patients and his, his other friends that he had in the dentistry. So yeah. that's my word of the day and his relationships. Love it. Love it. Rob. And I think mine, everything they said is correct. I'll say the journey. I think it's about the journey. It's not about the destination. If you are not enjoying your journey, then you need to reevaluate what you're doing and make the changes to make yourself happier. Because this is a difficult profession. As you know, Kirk, and our friends on here know, this can be a challenging profession. Yeah. And I'm not even talking about, there's so many facets to it, right? Whether it be a business owner, chairside dentist, there's so many facets to it. It's difficult. It's difficult to be really good at everything. In fact, you can't be a master of everything. You, you, yeah. you got to pick and choose what you're going to be really good at and dedicate it. And then find other talented people to do the other things that you either don't have the time or the knowledge base to do, but enjoy the journey. If you're doing something that you're not enjoying, then find out what's going to make you happy and start doing it. Because at the end of the day, the only person you're going to be able to blame is yourself. It's not right to blame your team members or your spouse or your business partner or your practice consultant or a dental company or a dental supplier if you're not doing what you want to do. Find what you like to do, get really, really good at it and enjoy the journey and surround yourself with people who are the same as you, meaning they have the same vision of where they want to be, what type of dentistry they want to perform, uh, where they want to be recognized in their community or nationally in, in dentistry. Surround yourself with people, like-minded people who will help build you up, not around the people that will tear you down and you'll have a great career. Amen, brother. These are phenomenal words from three incredible human beings. And I'll just piggyback on what all of you have said is like, if you're a dentist listening, you might be thinking, well, easy for you guys to say, you don't understand. And I've watched this most notably with you, Kevin, is like, grab your pail and go out and milk the cow. And what I mean by that is a lot of people grab their pail and grab this stool and they sit in the middle of the pasture and they wait for this cow to back up. And they go, a cow's gotta come by sometime and I'll get the milk. No, you gotta go out, find these relationships, edge yourself into them. So Kevin, they didn't just go, hey, look, we're looking for some young kid. Let's find somebody in Michigan. No, you kept bugging the, you know, you know what out of them. And next thing you know, I'm like, you're walking around the restorative academy. Bill Robbins is calling you his son. Like, how the hell did that happen? That's freaking awesome. Like, you know, you, yeah, like I know. <laughs> in, a, in a very soft, humble way, you've got to invite yourself to the party. Like I'm not included on this text chain, but I'm going to bug the crap out of these guys next week until they include me. But that's how you find a mentor you got to go out and get them you got opportunity doesn't come to you you got to go get it would you guys agree like somehow some way yeah so. i've never nodded yeah. my head enough <laughs> in an hour <laughs> I'm just, i love this no. head, yes. no, you this actually i wish i would have not remembered that word mentorship I, I, the biggest, you know, obviously practicing and now teaching my own course, the protocol has been transformative for me. And the last thing is you said the word is mentorship. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have mentors in this profession. And now I find myself really mentoring young dentists and I enjoy it. Kirk at a, at a completely new level because I want them to enjoy our profession. I want them to be successful. I can't define what success is for everybody. You have to choose what your success is is and what you want it to be but mentorship for young dentists is is a passion of mine actually right now it's an overused word but i it's really a core i'd rather a core issue for me so if there's anybody out there that's looking for mentorship I, i'm willing to help you out with what limited time that i have i've always wanted to help out young dentists on this journey awesome. i want to put a plug for your course too the protocol 
So I think that's just going to be one of those things that I can't wait to go down in November. I was talking to my partner about this. She's going to come down with me, I hope, um, because I think it's just going to be something that's going to be so special. So if you're looking to, to get some more knowledge from Ritter and Ramsey, sign up for the protocol. I don't know how, I don't know how you do it. I think the event bright or whatever it is, but you'll talk about that, but go to the November one. Cause I'll be there and I can't <laughs> wait to be down there in, in November. So hey, West, Palm, be a great time. West Palm's not a bad place to go in November. It was funny. You when I got, when I got introduced at the restorative Academy, uh, Ed Boreal says, yeah, Ritter who's slumming it down in Jupiter, which was really a very funny line. <laughs> yeah. November is not really the worst time of year to be in Florida. No, it's <laughs> actually a beautiful time to be here. And thank you very much, Kevin. We, we can't wait to have you and host you and, and just share everything along our combined. I mean, basically me and Chris have a combined almost 50 years in dentistry and we give away everything. We hide nothing because we want you to take what we know and then implement it back in your practice and then take it and springboard off of that and do even better than us. That's the greatest mark of a teacher is you want your, your students to do better than you and you're proud when they do better than you. Yeah. And that's what I want to see happen. Pat, Pat, what do you think yeah. we catch yeah. a flight down there and we make Ritter and Ranzi pay dinner for us at like their favorite place? <laughs> if we show. Yeah. <laughs> Come on down. I was down. gonna say that, can we, I think we're just gonna crash. <laughs> oh, no, I don't think we're gonna crash. We're gonna crash. I know you're gonna crash. That's but great. I think, you know, one thing though, Rob, you nailed it. I think young dentists that are listening to the show, man, oh man, don't do stuff. When I lecture, I ask this question to the audience. One of the first slides I do, how many people do root canals? Half the room raises their hands. I say, great. How many people avoid canals? Half of those hands go down. And then my next question is, why are you doing root canals? And they'll just look at me like, because I have to. No, no. uh-uh. Do, I do three procedures in my office. Three, we have three, three, maybe four. Do what you do and just try it. Like Rob said, do it well and do the rest of the stuff you don't want to do. And believe me, not to fill your schedule. Your schedule will be full for stuff that you like to do and you will enjoy dentistry so much more. I'm a firm ding, believer. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. Yeah. yeah. Drop the mic. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, what a way to bring us home, Pat. All right. We're going to do an episode on the three procedures. I want to know like how okay, it all so breaks what are we down. Doing I want wait, to know. What, wait, here's yeah. what we're, we're going to call it three procedures in three days. I like that. Ooh, and I then like you... that too. <laughs> I like that a lot. There you go, now, the next time we got to have Brother Bob on this, right? So we got to yeah. schedule it appropriately. Okay, so here, you did. Your job is to nail him <laughs> down. Like no, that guy uh, has more. Uh -huh. He's he chases more shiny objects than any person I've ever met. Like he he gets he doesn't even finish sentences. He starts sentences and he's like, I don't even know what I was trying to say. But like, um, maybe you can you can nail him down for the next one. I love, I'm going to leave that up to Kevin and, and to Pat. Kevin, we'll that's your, you're up, Kevin. Yeah, I'm yeah, out. I got it. There you go. That'll be great. All right, great. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for being on. Hold on while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to Best Practices Show. Hey, if you enjoyed today, like I know you did, do us a favor, hit the share button, share this with your friends. Keep sending us suggestions for things that you guys want to see. I'll line it up. I'll put the experts on like these three guys, and we'll ask them the questions and get inside the minds of some great thinkers here. And remember, you can better practice, better life. It's a great industry, and you're on the right path. So until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day.